Hello everyone, and welcome to the first true and official video of the Calculus One series. The goal for this video is to review, in my opinion, the most important material from your prerequisite courses. By no means is this going to be the only review that we do during the course. However, I think that these topics are so fundamental that they deserve separate attention and their own day. To begin with, we're going to start by talking about lines. One of the fundamental ideas of calculus is to take something that's curved and break it down and approximate it by a sequence of line segments. Because as a general rule, things that are linear are much more simple than things that are curved. So that's what we're going to start with. We're going to start with reviewing the equation of a line and how to find the slope. We also discussed the fact that one of the fundamental ideas of calculus is this idea of rate of change. When you adjust the input variable a little bit, how is the output variable affected? So we're going to go back to pre-calculus one and briefly review the first situation where we encountered a rate of change which was the average rate of change of a function. We're going to review that. You will want to be pretty skilled at dealing with composition and dealing with piecewise functions. So we're going to take some time today to review those ideas. Linear equations. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to review some terminology. Throughout this course, you'll find that I put a lot of emphasis on terminology. So let's recall that the slope of a line is the amount that y, the output variable, changes. When you increase x, the input variable, by one unit. Let's also recall that we had a term called the y-intercept. If we're not using y to represent the output variable, we might also call this the vertical intercept. The vertical intercept is what we get when we plug in zero for the input. This is the output corresponding to an input of x equals 0. Or more generally, if you're not using x for the input variable, whenever your input is 0. Let's have a look at the line graphed in cyan below, and let's see what the slope might be, what the vertical intercept might be. Now to see the vertical intercept, all we have to do is look for where the graph intersects this vertical axis because the vertical axis corresponds to all the locations where x is equal to 0. So I'm going to look on the graph for a location where x is equal to 0. And I see that that occurs at a point with a y value with a height of negative 1. So my vertical intercept is negative 1 in this case. So then I can ask the question, all right, what is the slope of this line? What happens when x increases by one unit? Now look at the scale of this graph. x equals 0 is right in the center. x equals 1 is indicated right here. So now, suppose that I travel from one point on the graph, where x equals 0, say, and I increase x by one unit. If I then look for a point on the graph where x is 1 currently, that brings me to a point on the graph where the y has changed to 2. So I increased x by 1 unit, and to get back onto the graph, I had to increase y by 3 units. So the amount that y changed when I increased x by 1 unit, y changed by positive 3, and that's our slope. Now let's recall that if we have a line where the slope is represented by the letter m and the y-intercept is represented by the letter b, 
then such a line has the equation y equals mx plus b, slope times x, and then add the intercept. Every single line can be expressed in this format, with the exception of one variety of line, and that's a vertical line. Vertical lines are unique because they don't have a slope. Vertical lines are unique because if you increase x by one unit, you can never get back onto the line. And as a result, there is no way to measure the change in y. If you go over by one unit x, then you can't find the line anywhere in that location to get back onto it. So you can't do this process that we did before of starting from one point on the graph, going over in the positive x direction by one unit, and then finding a point on the graph at that horizontal location. That's not possible with a vertical line. And as a result, vertical lines don't have any slope. Now, if you happen to just know two arbitrary points on a line, there is a way to calculate the slope. And that's to go ahead and take what's colloquially called rise over run. What this is telling you to do is to take the final y value, which I'll call y sub 2, and subtract the initial y value. Do the same thing with the x's, final x minus initial x, and then divide the two. This will also measure the slope, given two arbitrary points on the line. Average rate of change. Set up a scenario. Suppose we have someone driving a car on a long trip. We have some data about the amount of miles that they have traveled at two different points of time. One hour into this trip, let's call that x equals 1, for one hour has passed. Suppose that their odometer shows 30,000 miles. Quite a new car, isn't it? Let's represent the fact that they have 30,000 miles on their odometer by the data y equals 30,000. So I'm using x to store the time. I'm using y to store the miles on the odometer. Now, changing the time a little bit, now three hours after they've, after they've left, so x is equal to three. Suppose that now we have 30,108 miles on the odometer. So from this information, you know, what might we conclude about how fast this person was actually driving during this time? Well, the first thing that I'm going to try and figure out is how far they traveled in this time. How far did they travel between these two times? Well, at the end of their journey, they had 30,108 miles in total. At the beginning of this time period that we're interested in, they had 30,000 miles in total. So between the times of x equals 1 and x equals 3, they traveled in total 108 miles. Now let's think about how long it took them to drive this 108 miles. final time that we measured was three hours after the le they left. The initial time that we measured was one hour after they left. The amount of time that they traveled between those was two hours. So they traveled 108 miles in two hours. So how fast was the person driving? We can find their rate by taking the, the distance traveled, 108 miles, dividing it by the time that it took them to cross that distance, two hours, and we get a speed of 59 miles per hour.
Now let's stop and acknowledge something about what we have just calculated and how it answers the question that was asked. How fast was the person driving? Well, they traveled 108 miles in two hours, so they drove at approximately 59 miles per hour. They traveled at this speed on average. What we are not saying, however, is that they drove at this exact speed during that entire two hour window. More realistically, there were some moments when the car was moving faster than this, and there were some moments, maybe there was some traffic, maybe they had to take a corner or do a turn where they were driving slower than this. So this is just a measure of their average overall speed between the times of x equals one and x equals three. It doesn't really give us any information about the number on the car's speedometer at any point during this journey. That's what average rate of change does. It gives you an average measurement of how much a function's value is changing over an interval. In mathematical terms, we would have y, which is some function of x. For example, we might have a number of miles on the odometer, which is a function of how long we've been driving. If we want to know, on average, how much y is changing between two inputs, x1 and x2, then we're going to get a formula which looks a lot like the formula for the slope of a line. The average rate of change between x1 and x2 is the difference of the two y values, the y value at the second x minus the y value at the first x, divided by the difference in the two x values. So in the scenario above, the scenario with the driving car, we could express it in the following way using mathematical language. 59 miles per hour is the average rate of change, average rate of change, of the y value of the number of miles on the odometer on the time interval going from one hour has passed to the time interval where three hours have passed. We calculated this by taking the y value at time three, subtracting the y value at time one, that's f of x2 minus f of x1, and dividing that by the difference in the two x's, three minus one. That gave us the average rate of change, which in this particular scenario was a measure of the car's average speed during that time interval. Now, preparing for what we're about to do, I want to ask about what if we took that same scenario, but instead of having our second time being three hours into the trip, suppose that our second time was one hour and just a couple of minutes. So instead of having a time interval from one hour to three hours, what if we considered a time interval from one hour to, roughly speaking, one hour and one minute? In this case, suppose that we have glanced at the odometer at this time. Our odometer read 30,000.9. What is the average rate of change of the number of miles on this time interval? So in this case, we can take our final y minus our initial y. We can take our final x minus our initial x they traveled 0 0.9 miles in approximately one minute, 0 0.02 of an hour, which gives us a final average rate of change of 45 miles per hour.
So, depending on the time interval, we got two very different answers for the average rate of change for the average speed of the car. So what do you think is the best estimate, or I should say, what do you think is the better estimate of the actual speed of the car that showed up on the speedometer at the very moment when x was equal to 1, precisely one hour into this trip? Which is a better estimate, the average rate of change, the average speed on the interval from 1 to 3, or the average rate of change on the much shorter time interval, 1 to 1.02. I would argue that the smaller time interval gives you a better estimate of what the car's actual speed was at the time x equals 1. You see, when you have a large time interval, 1 to 3, there are a lot of things that could have happened to change the car's speed during that two-hour window. They could have been stuck in traffic and been in a complete standstill for a significant period of time, perhaps. Or they could have been speeding, they could have been on the interstate moving very quickly for a long period of time. A lot could have happened in that two-hour time period. But if you take the smaller time interval from 1 to 1.02, then there are not a lot of things that could happen to change the car's speed from 45 miles per hour to something that would be much larger or much slower for a significant period of time. Now going forward into calculus, what we'll be doing is we will be taking this time interval and making it smaller and smaller and smaller. And as the time interval becomes smaller, it becomes a better and better representation of what the car was actually doing at the very instant when x was exactly equal to 1. And that will give us the car's actual speed at the time x equals 1. The next topic that's worthwhile for us to review is this idea of composition. The kind of scenario where you would encounter composition is something like the following. So we have a function g, and g is designed to, we just started making yogurt from milk in our household. So G is designed to take in a quantity of yogurt that you might want to make, and it outputs the amount of milk necessary to make that yogurt. Now you've got another function H, which tells you, okay, if you want to buy a certain quantity of milk, how much is that going to cost you? So the question is, you know, Suppose that I wanted a function where I could put into the function an amount of yogurt that I wanted to make for myself. And that function would directly output the cost. Directly output the cost without having to go through this sort of intermediate step of calculating how much milk that I would need to buy. And the answer to that question is composition. Functions are read from right to left. So if we wanted to chain together the functions h and g, we would chain it together so that we could eliminate this overlapping situation where g outputs milk and h inputs milk, and we could put yogurt directly into the function h composed with g, where g is on the right and h is on the left. This eliminates the intermediate step, and this composed function will take yogurt in and produce the cost directly. Composition is a way of chaining together two functions, where the output of one function coincides with the input of another function. If the output of one function and the input of the other function represent the same physical quantity, then you can chain those functions together and that process is called composition. In practice, this is a way of increasing computational efficiency. Now, when you're trying to find a formula for the function h composed with g, which is sometimes written with the circle between, sometimes is written like this, the procedure is as follows. You start by taking the formula for h of x. 
Take the formula for h of x. This is the function which is on the left hand side. This is also the function which is outside of all the parentheses. So I might call this the left, or more commonly you'll see this called the outer function. Take the left hand side or outer function, look at the formula for the outer function, and everywhere you see an x in the formula, replace that x with the formula for g. g of x being the function that appears toward the right hand side of your composed expression slash the function which is on the inside of the parentheses. So I would call g of x the right or the inner function. I'm going to do some simple examples of composition. We really won't need to compose functions in this class so much as we will need to undo composition that has been done by someone else. So let's just do a few simple examples to get the idea, and then let's move into something that's more representative of the information that we will actually need in this class. For example, someone gives us h of x equals square root x. Someone gives us g of x equals x squared plus 3. Someone wants us to find a formula for h of g of x. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this formula for h of x, but instead of x, I'm going to take it and replace it by the entire formula for g of x. The formula for g of x is x squared plus 3. So I'm going to remove x from underneath the square root, and in its place, I'm going to put in the entire formula, x squared plus 3. This would be a formula for h of g of x, the composition. Similar example, we have h of x equals e to the x, g of x equals cosine. Let's find a formula for h of g of x. Instead of having an exponent of x, I'm going to remove that x and put the entire formula for g of x in that position. No longer e to the x, but now e to the cosine of x. This would be a formula for h of g of x. In this scenario, h of x is equal to x divided by x plus 1. g of x is the natural log. h of x has two instances of x, and I need to replace both of them with the formula for g. So no longer x divided by x plus 1, but now I'm going to take both of those x's and replace them with the natural log of x, which is the formula for g of x. Now here's what we will really need to be able to do. We're going to need to take a given function and try and break it down as two simpler functions. To give you an example, suppose someone gave us a function f of x where we're taking the square root of this function x cubed plus x squared plus 5. Can I take f of x and break it down as the composition of two simpler functions? Now when I'm doing something like this, the square root of big mess, I'm reminded a lot of the first example from the previous page, where we took the square root of x we bopped x out from underneath the square root, and then we took the entire formula for g of x and put it under the root where x used to live. So inspired by that, I'm going to try and break down f of x in this way. I'm going to say the outer function is the square root of x. Then, to get the function f that I'm given in this problem, I removed x from h, and I put the big mess x cubed plus x squared plus 5 in its place. Let's check and see if this is right. If we were going to find a formula for h of g of x ourselves, I would take the formula for h, I would remove x from its position, and I would put the entire g of x in that position. 
This is the same thing as the f of x that we were given, which means that our breakdown is correct. Let's try it with f of x equals cosine of x squared. I'm going to go ahead and just rewrite this a little bit so that it might look a little bit more like one function has been placed inside of another. So let's suppose that I took my outer function and set it to be the function which squares things, and the inner function to be the thing that I decided to square. Let's see if this is a valid breakdown of the function f of x. If I were going to manually calculate h of g of x, I would take h of x, and everywhere there was an x, I would stick in the entire formula for g. So instead of doing x squared, I would do whatever g is squared. g is cosine, so h of g would be cosine squared. And this is the same thing as f of x. So this is another successful breakdown. What if instead of cosine squared, we had cosine of x squared? Well, let's try to have h be literally the function which is on the outside. Cosine is the function on the outside. And let's have g be the function which is literally on the inside x squared is on the inside. Let's check to see if these two compose to give us the function f of x that we were given. If I take the formula for h, and everywhere there was an x, I put a g of x in x's place. Now instead of cosine x, we have cosine of the formula for g, which is x squared. And that's the same thing that we were given. When I approach these kinds of problems, where we have to take a function and break it down as a composition of two simpler functions, my general approach is this. In pre-calculus 1, we were given this huge list of basic, what were called toolkit functions. 1 over x, cosine of x, sine of x, e to the x, x cubed, square root of x, etc. Look for a shape or format that resembles one of these toolkit functions. The toolkit function that gives you the shape of the function is usually the outer function h. And the quantity that has replaced x as compared to one of these toolkit functions, that's usually the function g. To give you an example of that approach, suppose that I got the same question, but this time I'm trying to break down 1 over 2x plus 3. In terms of format, this function looks an awful like the toolkit reciprocal function 1 over x. The basic toolkit function that I'll use for h of x, I'll use 1 over x. So then I ask myself, okay, what formula took x's place to give me the actual function in my problem? The toolkit function has 1 over x, but the function in my problem has 1 over 2x plus 3. Where there used to be an x, there is now a 2x plus 3. So that would be my guess for the inner function. Once I've guessed, I'm now going to go ahead and check my answer. So I'm going to say, all right, what's h of g of x? To determine that, I'm going to take the formula for h of x, and everywhere there was an x, I'm going to remove it and put g of x in its place. And sure enough, that is the same thing as the f of x that we were given. To conclude today's review, let's review piecewise functions. So for piecewise functions, they differ from regular functions in the following way. You know, for a regular function, you might be given a singular formula. f of x is equal to this guy. And when you go to evaluate this function at a point, 
For example, if you're asked to evaluate this function at x equals 3, we understand this to mean take that formula and where there was an x, stick a 3 in and see what you get. So we would do f of 3 equals 3 squared plus 1 result 10. Now this is different from piecewise functions because piecewise functions usually are described in terms of more than one formula. An example would be this, f of x is equal to x minus 1 if x is less than 3, is equal to 2x for x is between 3 and 5, and is equal to x squared for x is greater than 5. This piecewise function consists of three different formulas, and which formula you use, which formula you plug x into, depends on the value of x. For example, Someone says evaluate f of 0. Which formula do I plug 0 into? Do I plug it into x minus 1? Do I plug it into 2x? Or do I plug it into x squared? In order to answer that question, I'm going to check which one of these inequalities on the right hand side is true for my particular value of x. So I'm going to say, is x less than 3? That's actually true. x is less than 3 if x is 0. x is not between 3 and 5. 0 is definitely not between 3 and 5. 0 is definitely not larger than 5. So because 0 less than 3 is the true statement, and that's the inequality corresponding to the first formula, I'm going to plug 0 into the first formula. And that is the result of f of 0. Now let's compare this with f of 4. Evaluate f of 4, so what function should I plug 4 into? x minus 1, 2x, or x squared? For x equals 4, this time 4 is not less than 3. Which means I cannot use the first formula. However, 4 is between 3 and 5. 4, of course, is not strictly greater than 5. So, to evaluate f of 4, I'm going to plug 4 into the formula that corresponds to the true inequality. The true inequality this time was the second one. So, I'm going to plug 4 into the second formula. f of 4 is 2 times 4 is 8. And correspondingly 7, which formula does 7 fit into? Well, in this case, 7 is definitely not smaller than 3. 7 is definitely not between 3 and 5. However, 7 is most assuredly greater than 5. So, because that's the true inequality here, I'm going to plug 7 into x squared. 7 squared result 49. Let's see how this idea manifests itself in the graph of a piecewise function. You graph all three formulas, but only for the values of x that correspond to their inequalities. So let me give you an example. f of x equals x minus 1. This is a line with slope positive 1. and y-intercept negative 1. So is it appropriate for me to graph the entire line x minus 1? No, it's not. If I'm going to graph this piecewise function, I should only graph the line x minus 1 for x's which are strictly smaller than 3. I'm only going to draw it from 3 downward.
Now I want you to notice something important. I've just drawn a hole at the location where x is equal to 3. Because x equals 3 is not covered by the first formula. x equals 3 does not make the first inequality true. 3 is not strictly less than 3. So I have to omit the point x equals 3 from the green line, x minus 1, because x equals 3 does not make that inequality true. It makes it false. So the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to graph the second part of this function, 2x, for the x's between 3 and 5 between the values of x equals 3 and x equals 5. Now notice that unlike with the green line, I've taken the two endpoints of the pink line and I've filled them in with whole dots. Not dots with a hole in the center, but dots that have been filled. The reason that I fill the dots in the case of the pink line is because if I consider the outmost cases, x equals 3 and x equals 5, x equals 3 actually does make the second inequality true. So x equals 3, that exact value, is covered by the second formula, 2x. The same thing is true for 5. 5 is less than or equal to 5, less than or equal to. So x equals 5 also makes the second inequality true, and therefore I'm going to include it on the second part of the graph in pink here. Okay, so now x squared, which is unfortunately giant. Uh, I'm going to ruin my scale by doing this, so I'm just going to say no space for x squared, c, desmos, and I'm going to show you how to graph piecewise functions on desmos.com. So here I am on desmos.com, and I'm going to try and graph the piecewise function x minus 1, 2x, x squared. However, at the moment, you know, I haven't included any of the inequalities that are associated with these formulas in my function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and include those now. I'm going to type in, in squiggly brackets, x less than 3 next to x minus 1. And we can see with the red graph that what that has done is it has stopped drawing the graph at x equals 3. It's only drawn the graph for x's which are strictly less than 3, which is what we want. I'm going to do the same thing with 2x. I'm going to say I only want 2x to be valid for x's which are x less than or equal to 3 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 5. And notice here we have this little teeny line segment. And finally, I'm going to restrict x squared so that it's only being drawn for x greater than 5. But this would be the computerized version on Desmos of this piecewise function. The red graph is drawn for x's less than 3, the blue graph is drawn for x's between 3 and 5, and the green graph is drawn for x's strictly greater than 5. But notice something that this graph lacks that our graph had. Our graph had either filled dots or empty dots to tell the reader which function was valid at these sort of transition points here. Because we have a fill dot at 3 uh, on the second function that tells the reader to use the second function, the 2x function, when x is 3 itself. But the computerized graph doesn't include any dots or holes to tell the reader what is happening at these transition locations. So that is a very brief review of some of the most important material from Algebra and from Pre-Calculus 1, uh, including piecewise functions, compositions, uh, lines, and average rate of change.